Well, welcome. Tonight, we're going over a topic that I hope is only um, an academic curiosity for everybody watching. Hope that you never meet these people. <laughs> hope that you never have to take care of their ex take advantage of their expertise. But it's always been amazing to me when you think of the last few decades that a number of us grew up here at the center of the universe. What amazing depth and breadth of medical care, especially in the field of oncology with the Farber here and now and all. So tonight we want to go over a topic that should you ever need to know will be critical that you understand your options and feel comfortable with the services you can get right here in Milford. So why don't we start with, well, a veteran coming back, but why don't we start with an introduction. Um, my name is Ron Shiloh. I'm a radiation oncologist practicing at Brigham Women's and Dana-Farber Cancer Center here in Milford. And um, although I treat a wide range of cancers, today I'm here to talk about lung cancer. And I'm John Phillips. I'm uh, also a radiation oncologist practicing at Brigham and Women's Dana-Farber, uh, also here in Milford. Ron and I work together. Uh, and I also have a, a special focus on lung cancer. So now, when we look at oncologists, you know, radiation oncologists, it seems like you have a specialty, but that you're either a generalist or not. I've always been a bit confused. How does that work out, Ron? So, uh, within radiation oncology, we're all, when we go through training, we all learn how to take care of uh, patients with all different kinds of cancer diagnoses. Um, and for some radiation oncologists who, who choose to go down a more uh, specialized path, you, you can choose to focus on treating one or two disease sites. Uh, typically, if you are practicing in the community setting, like here in Milford, then you would be practicing, um, you'd be treating a, a wider variety of cancers, although uh, also trying to maintain a focus on one, one or two specific disease sites. So now, when we look at who you would treat, mm -hmm. you know, which organs, I guess that would be the way to break it up. Yeah. Um, is lung cancer still the dominant area? So, um, in general, the most common cancer is skin cancer, but it's typically cured pretty easily at the dermatologist's office. There are some variations to that. Uh, but when you move beyond that into the ones that really require uh, the expertise of a multidisciplinary team, the main uh, cancers we're talking about really uh, that we treat and the, the main ones that we see are, are, are breast cancer uh, in, in women, prostate cancer in men, and then lung cancer in both men and women. So uh, there are a wide variety beyond that, but really those three uh, are, are So vulnerable. lung cancer is the third? Uh, lung cancer is the second most mm -hmm. common, second. Um, but prostate is the most common in men, breast is the most common in women, lung is the second most common in both. But now when we grew up, so, not you, you're too young. <laughs> when you get to the old people. Sure. You know, when I was living in Paris, I don't think anybody didn't smoke. Because if you didn't primarily hold the cigarette, the cloud in the office lets you take advantage, <laughs> you know, of the smoking experience, whether you wanted to or not. It seems like there's been a huge swing, at least in the U.S. Are the rates of lung cancer going down be commensurate with the amount of smoking? So there's, there's always a little bit of a lag time delay between when an intervention happens, in this case a, a really vigorous effort to get people to stop smoking, and when the health effects are seen. Uh, so what we tend to see now is that uh, that period where the cancer cases actually drop is happening for men. Uh, but the, for women uh, who are stopping smoking a little later, so there's about a 10 year delay between me when men stop smoking, when women stop smoking, we're just now starting to see the decline in uh, women's lung cancer. So there's a little bit of a lag for both. So I would almost think, it, okay, it could be a generation. You know, if you think about it, I mean, I remember, I love my cigars. <laughs> I remember them fondly. But yeah, I remember a friend of mine and I had, just come back from overseas, we had these nice um, Cohiba Robustos. And we wanted to enjoy that cigar. Of 
course, I thought I was going to get arrested because we're walking down the street, kind of looking, you think the kids can see us yet? <laughs> no, let's walk a little further. I said, you know, some one of your neighbors is going to look out the door, see two old men sitting on the curb smoking a cigar, and call the cops. <laughs> but, you know, in a way it was a good stigma because it really did get the vast majority. I mean, there's no smoking in offices anymore. Mm -hmm. There's really except for you know areas outside you don't see people smoking yeah yeah no i think you're right and i think that as you said it is a generational thing and i think the rates of smoking of people starting to smoke is is decreasing um, so the younger generation of children and young adults today do have lower rates of smoking than um, older generations which is why as john was saying i think that there's a little bit of a lag time and We'll, we'll start so to see can, decreased can you rates. see most of the lung cancer in the 60 plus people and not as much in the younger y you know there, there are exceptions to, to that rule but in general that's that's the rule we really think of lung cancer as, as a disease in that 60 to 80 age range but uh, 50 to 60 mm -hmm. more common below 50 it's less common but still happens we still see a handful of cases from time to time now, does it help when people, I mean, somebody could say, I've been smoking my whole life. Why should I stop now? What do you say? So, I mean, I think you were starting to answer it yourself. It does help um, to quit smoking um, in all aspects of health. We're not only talking about lung cancer, but also cardiovascular risk and risk of other illnesses that are associated with smoking. But certainly, the further out you are from when you quit smoking, the the less your risk of developing lung cancer, but the risk doesn't go away completely. Yeah. And, and even along those lines, um, I have patients ask me that all the time. Uh, you know, I've been diagnosed with a cancer. Why should I stop smoking now? Uh, and even in that case, it, it even makes the side effects from the treatments that we give easier mm -hmm. when people stop smoking. Because you're going to exacerbate the problem? Yeah. You exacerbate the problem and it just makes it really harder to recover from the treatments that we give, whether it's chemo, surgery, or radiation. Um, being an active smoker makes the side effects from any treatment we do substantially worse. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't imagine how you can be an active smoker. I mean, my kids would hit me with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it wasn't anything that, you know, we drove into their, you know, you get some militant non-smokers. Okay. We never that way. It just they come home from school and I mean they to their grandfather pappy you know you're gonna die can't you stop so you're around for me and it's like ooh, I'm not going in the middle of that one now my father-in-law can fight his own battles right <laughs> yeah is smoking still the main or the largest cause for lung cancer yes it is it's it, it's a it is the number one cause and I it, any other causes are, are far below that. That's what I was going to say. So it's not a 52-48 split here. Right. No. So now, first of all, you know, when you think of reducing my risk, I stop smoking or I don't start, mm -hmm. which, you know, God bless people who are smoking in front of their kids. I have a lot less sympathy for mm -hmm. because kids do tend to mimic their parents. Yeah. So they don't see any smoking in the house, maybe you'll get a better chance of them not starting. What else can I do to lower my risk of, say, lung cancer? For, uh, for, for smokers, the, the number one thing is to stop smoking yes. and time. Uh, so the, the, like Ron said, the, f uh, the farther down the road you get, uh, we typically think of 15 years as being a good time point where you see a, a vast reduction. So 15 years of having stopped smoking, your, your risk starts to drop, but it never drops to Zero. what it would be if you were a non-smoker. Um, so th that's really the, the main thing. Um, there are other things you can do for risk reduction, like maintaining a healthy weight, exercising, those go uh, contribute somewhat to, uh, to, to lowering your risk, but the main thing is... So when my primary care physician calls me fat old man, <laughs> <laughs> it's a hint that maybe I should lose some weight. You might ought to get a new primary care physician, <laughs> too. <laughs> he says it very tactfully, but I can see you know, I can feel what he's telling me. And, and he said, yeah, wouldn't be bad if you'd lose about 30 pounds. I'm like, okay, 
So he's calling me a fat old man. I can understand that. But I never think of weight loss. I think of cardiovascular issues. Mm -hmm. But I never think of that as a cancer reducing. Yeah, it, it seems to, you know, the associations uh, trying to draw those conclusions out of studies is tough, um, but it seems to be associated with a lot of malignancies, but it's not as strong of a factor where you can say this is the cause. Mm -hmm. But it does seem to add some contribution to it, does seem to add to the risk of, uh, it makes all the treatments harder if, if uh, you do unfortunately get diagnosed. And so uh, maintaining a healthy, healthy weight, uh, exercising, those can go a long way toward uh, not necessarily preventing you from having a cancer, but for making uh, all the treatments much well, easier. Well, I think also though, if I do have cancer, it's gonna help my body fight it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, you say the side effects of whatever you know, whether you're nuking me or blasting me with chemo, I mean, it's going to take a toll on my body if I have a stronger body to begin with. So we go back to the old exercise. It kind of reminds me of when you had a cold and everybody had the famous chicken soup. <laughs> and all you had to do was wait 10 days and drink a lot of water. And somehow, whether you had chicken soup or not, miracle, you right, were yeah. cured. <laughs> One of the questions always comes up, when should I be screened? Yeah. How would you answer that? Well, so there actually are um, guidelines now that, that um, physicians can use to appropriately screen. So fat old men get preference, I hope? <laughs> <laughs> In this case, not necessarily, no. no. I um, lose every time. <laughs> so specifically, um, uh, the guidelines that um, most people go by, um, which is put out by the U.S. Preventive Task Force, um, they suggest that, and this is based on a study that looked at um, screening in a certain population, they suggest that people who are between the age of 55 and 74 um, who have greater than a 30 pack year history of smoking, and a pack year is actually the number of cigarettes you smoke per day times the number of years you've smoked. So if you smoke a pack per day for 30 years, that's a 30 pack year oh, history. Oh, okay. I was gonna say 30 packs. Yeah. Is that physically <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um Then those individuals, and it doesn't, and if you, even if you've quit smoking, if, you, if, if you've quit smoking only within the past 15 years, as John was saying earlier, then you're still at a higher risk. Those individuals um, should be screened for lung cancer, and that would um, involve having a, a CAT scan of the chest to, to see if there's any evidence of lung cancer. And that study that was done that then led to the guidelines that are currently used showed that there were a higher number of cancers diagnosed at an early stage that could then be treated successfully and that those patients who were screened um, lived longer than those who didn't undergo so screening. So now, you talk about scanning my cat, and people here scanning my pet, and they hear all these scans. Mm -hmm. What is a CAT scan in layman's terms? A CAT scan is basically a, a series of x-rays that are done that kind of take a look at your body slice by slice. So it's like slice, sliced bread. It is like sliced bread, yeah. And so by looking at it slice by slice, you can get a better look inside that that loaf of bread, so to speak, and, and see if there's anything How concerning. How many slices do you make on my body? Oh, that's a good question. It, it, it varies by what your, your goal is. Mm -hmm. So uh, depending on what your goal is. You want to slice, I'm doing, you know, a screen. So you're mm -hmm. slicing a fat old man. <laughs> is it 50 slices, 100 slices? Uh, it's usually more than 100. So when we're looking for these tiny nodules that may be less than a, well, that, a centimeter. That's what I'm wondering. Each slice is usually only about two millimeters mm -hmm. in size. So oh, we're wow. passing through the chest going two millimeters at a time. I really like to think about it as, you know, the chest x-ray that most people are familiar with. Uh, I like to think of that as, as the 2D version. Uh, and CAT scan is really looking at your anatomy uh, including any, any potential cancer pathology uh, in 3D. And so that, that's, that's kind of the, the way I, I like if, to If I go it. in and you do a normal x-ray like we think of, so it's a two-dimensional picture, can you see enough? What would make you go to a CAT scan? Well, so that, that's actually a question that was asked and 
an x-ray is not as um, precise as, as a CAT scan would be. And so, you know, th th you would essentially, when you're screening, you would just bypass the chest x-ray and go straight to a CAT scan because it's, it's not going to be as beneficial as, as doing a CAT scan right away. But now, is the x-ray a screen? I mean, how does insurance deal with this? You know, if you sit there and say, I've got a 40-pack rating or 30-pack mm -hmm. rating, yeah. do I go right away to scanning my cat? Or Yeah, so that's, the mo that's, that's really the important part of what, what Ron was talking about is uh, that study showing, it actually compared not, not screening to cat scans, but it compared x-rays. So people either got an x-ray every year or they got a cat scan. And it showed the cat scan was better. Uh, and so what that's really pushed is that insurance uh, will now pay for the CAT scan without having to have the x-ray or anything oh, like okay. that. So it's really kind of changed the practice uh, to allow people to get the test that, that, that we think is most sensitive for finding these things early on. So now realistically, if I'm 50, I only wish I was only 50, <laughs> but if I'm 50 years old and I was a smoker, shouldn't I go to my primary care and say, why are you not recommending a CAT scan? Well, so, um, you know, again, the, the You're gonna guidelines... You're going to with the primary care Well, guys. no, no. It's again, just to, be, just to be precise, the guidelines are actually for 55 and over. So okay, let's say so you're 55. 55. Yeah, then um, you, could very much, you could very well go to your primary care doctor's office and, and ask, ask about this. And then it, it entails having a conversation with them um, and... You know, but if, if it were ordered, then it, in all likelihood it would be covered by your insurance. Um, or if you're over 65, it'll be covered by Medicare um, to undergo that screening. Should I be worried that I'm getting medium well if you're doing 100 x-rays of me? <laughs> I mean, you know, you see, you sit down and the x-ray technician runs to the side, you know, behind a wall. So now you tell me you're going to do 100 of these. Should I be worried, John? Yeah, so, so that's, for this lung cancer screening, they specifically uh, designed it with uh, what Ron was talking about, which is a low-dose CAT scan. So uh, the, the tool that they use is intentionally designed to give you the least amount of radiation uh, while still providing the maximum amount of information. Uh, so, you know, there's, it's not zero risk, but the risk to any individual person is so tiny, and we really try to take great precaution uh, to uh, what's called image gently. So we try to uh, minimize the amount of x-rays you're exposed to, but if, and pick the right patients. So uh, with that criteria that Ron's talking about, we're really trying to select the people that are going to benefit the most. That's why we're not saying everybody out there should go line up outside the CAT scanner. We're really trying to pick the people who are going to benefit so that we're not imaging uh, people unnecessarily. See, that's one of the things like when you talk about mammograms, mm -hmm. you know, and all of a sudden you're reading all the biostatisticians saying, oh, it's not worth it unless. Yeah. And I sit there and say, well, I mean, if it's my sainted mother, my darling bride, or even my ungrateful offspring, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I mean, these are my dearest, you can't think of anything you'd value higher. Right. So telling me that, you know, the good news, Mrs. Jones, is 99% of the patients don't need it. Bad news, you're the 1%. You know, I, I don't get it. Of all the things that we could do, early detection seems to be the best. I mean, not smoking. Okay, I got the message. I shouldn't have ever smoked. But besides that, detecting it early seems to be the best next course of action. Yeah. Right, and I think that's, that's what John was getting at, is that with, within a certain population, that then it makes sense to do the screening because the benefit of doing the screening outweighs the potential harm. I mean, you brought up the radiation from it, and you know, radiation does have some risks associated with it. So if you um, choose the right population, then you're going to see a benefit within that population. But if you just chose to screen everyone, then you may end up with more harm from the screening than than. You know, if I good. get nuked at 55, so I'm getting my 100 slice radiation, 
when would I, and it's all clean, so I'm a happy person. I only wish, yeah, I'm a happy person. When would be the next time I should get nuked? So um, that's, that's not 100% clear yet, but it, the, the, the recommendations are to get it on a yearly basis. Oh, every year. Mm -hmm. Just just for a few years. Just for a few years, yeah. So so it's not forever, uh, but if you fit that criteria, uh, it, it's typically uh, each time we scan, we increase the likelihood that we'll find something. But there doesn't seem to be a benefit beyond doing it uh, for a few years. Uh, so if you're not doing it from 55 to 85, just for the next few years. So I've missed for four or five years. <laughs> I have not scanned my cat, so now I have to go have a discussion with my primary care. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the best way to put it, actually, is um, it, it's always good when you learn about these things, learn about things you may be at risk for, to have that discussion with your primary care physician. And I think that you're on to it where there's no, I mean, you can have guidelines, mm -hmm. but that's the reason they're called guidelines and not protocols. Yeah, if right. You, if you could find the stereotypical perfect human, you know, model, then you could say every 3.8 months do this, and mm -hmm. since we all seem to vary, absolutely, you yeah. do the guidelines. But that doesn't seem bad. That if I'm going to do it 55, 50, you know, four or five times. Mm -hmm. So at 60, you don't care about me anymore? <laughs> <laughs> no. Wait a minute, I'm turning 60. <laughs> well, that's why I'm saying too. I think that this is still evolving a little bit. Um, we're not sure for how long to extend that that yeah. screening. Um, or you know, so it's not, uh, you know, th these guidelines may still change in the years to come, but for now, as, as John was saying, it's recommended just for a few years. So I go in, I have an honest, open discussion with my primary care. And I think that's one of the things that it seems like traditional medicine is not evolving in a positive way. When they tell these primary care physicians, you have 13.2 minutes. You know, it just, I don't know how you get through everything, but somehow I think as a patient, I've got to figure out how to be open, not hem and haw. If I was a smoker, admit it. If I do bad things, admit it. And that way you can get to the crux of it and develop a treatment plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, aerosols. I always get yelled at when I'm out there painting or using spray cans. Is that a big issue? Uh, not uh, with the type of aerosols that they use in 2016. Uh, there are other exposures, uh, people that work in certain industries, so things where you spray silicon. Well, if I'm a car painter or I'm spraying silicon dust. Yeah, or mm -hmm. if you were, you know, worked in asbestos industries back before people uh, routinely wore protective equipment, those things do put you at an increased risk mm -hmm. for uh, lung cancer. But uh, for the vast majority today, uh, most of those things have, have had a lot of those chemicals removed from them. Well, that I would we think, know. I mean, the PPE issue, you know, the personal protective equipment, yeah. from an exposure point of view in the laboratory, mm -hmm. whether you want to or not, my policies are going to be you will use yeah. PPE. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if something happens to you, I'm putting my company at risk. I mean, that's the rationalization. If you really care about your employees, you don't want them getting sick on yeah. the job. Right. You know, God forbid that you find out something happened to an employee because you didn't enforce using PPE. Yeah. But I think more and more, at least in the biotech industry and all, you see it. You know, universal precautions have taken effect, especially when you're dealing with, you know, any kind of body fluids. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm glad to hear it's not just in our side, but it's going down. So I go and I scan my cat. Would I ever need my pet to be scanned? Would I ever need a pet scan? So sometimes a pet scan is used, you know, if there is a, um, a, a question about whether or not something is uh, cancerous, then a pet scan could be helpful to, you know, further um, elucidate whether or not that is but cancer. Right now, I understand I'm just taking 100 x-rays, so mm -hmm. slice bread. I yeah. can look at each slice. What does a PET scan do? So a PET scan is uh, different 
type of imaging than a CAT scan. And what a PET scan does is it identifies areas where there's a lot of cellular activity. So high glucose uptake rate. Yeah. So if a cell is really moving, mm -hmm. you sit there and say it could be cancerous. Could be, not necessarily, yeah. but uh, it's just sugar. You know, we're giving yeah. you a, a big injection of sugar. The sugar happens to, to be a little bit radioactive. So uh, whatever's eating that sugar really fast lights up, mm -hmm. and that uh, it tends to be the way cancer behaves. But there are some other, other things that do that, too. Now how about stem cells? Wouldn't they rate as high metabolism? You don't have that many in your body at okay. the ages that we're typically doing PET scans, but we do mm -hmm. see some uptake in things that are really metabolically active. A uh, PET scan doesn't work very well for, say, like the brain, mm -hmm. because your brain is eating so much sugar all the time that uh, the brain just lights up no matter what's going on in there. If you ask my wife, she'd say you'd be <laughs> fine scanning my brain because it works very slowly. <laughs> okay. So realistically, the PET scan would come if you have specific questions raising out of the CAT scan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you hope you never get there. Right. Okay, I've gone to my primary care. We had a discussion. I had the CAT scan. And he says, I see something. Now what happens? So now, um, you know, he could, depending on what it is that he sees, he could refer you to a specialist. Um, uh, often they'll refer either to a pulmonologist or a thoracic surgeon to, to kind of take over the workup at that point, um, which could entail um, having a PET scan, for example, or um, considering a biopsy, depending on how it looks. Often what will happen is something will just be monitored initially to see if it, it grows over time. Um, a lot of it depends on what the appearance is on the CAT scan. There are some things that are more or less concerning when you look at a CAT scan that, su that are more or less suggestive of it being cancer. Now, the minute you say, I'm going to refer you to a thoracic surgeon, I think of a man or a woman with knife. Why wouldn't I be referred to a, a general oncologist? Yeah, so what we try to do uh, over at uh, Dan Farber and Milford is try to take an integrative approach mm -hmm. to, the, to the question. Uh, so we, uh, our radiologist is the first person that sees these CAT scans. And uh, what they're trying to do is really put you in a risk category. Uh, and so they're trying to say, you know, you have a spot, but the chance of it being cancer is very low risk. So we'll just watch it. We'll get another scan in six months. Your primary care can do that. Uh, it's those higher risk patients uh, that go straight they kind of do not pass go, go straight to the thoracic surgeon. And the reason that we uh, go straight to the thoracic surgeon is because uh, they can uh, both, if they take the spot out, if that's an option for you, that can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. So rather than have a biopsy, they, with very little extra work, very little extra work for the patient, uh, they can actually just go in, take out the spot, and then we know exactly what it is. Uh, and so that tends to be kind so of So if you catch it early enough, John, the spot is small enough. Rather than go in and take a little bit of the spot mm -hmm. and then see whether or not it's cancerous, you just take the whole damn spot out and out damn spot yeah. and then worry about figuring it out later. Yeah, it's, it, the lung is kind of like a needle. Finding a spot in the lung can kind of be like a needle in a haystack. Uh, and so trying to pass a needle, even with great image guidance, can sometimes be a little tricky. Uh, and so we find that the highest yield often is to do a very, uh, as minimally invasive as possible uh, lung surgery and just take the, take the spot out. Spot's gone and you have the whole thing. So you really know for sure exactly what it Minimum is. Minimum evasive, you're cutting a chunk out of my lung. Yeah. How is that minimally evasive? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's all about uh, comparing it to what we used to do. Okay. So, you know, smaller incision, cam uh, fiber optic cameras, smaller surgery, faster recovery time. Okay, so you go to a thoracic surgeon, if he or she looks and says, don't think I want to take a knife to it. I mean, obviously, if it's one spot, and spot doesn't have any friends, you pop it out. When does he say or she say, hey, I need help? 
So a lot of that will depend on you know uh, an individual's overall health. If they have um, other illnesses, especially illnesses that may compromise their lung function, such as um, COPD, you mean COPD and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, then they may be um, uh, more hesitant about doing a surgery up front, and in those cases, they would take initial steps to to see what can be determined about it uh, before proceeding to surgery or maybe never even proceeding to surgery and proceeding directly to um, a different type of treatment such as radiation. Yeah. So I've gone primary care, thoracic, thoracic says no you're not really a candidate for immediate surgery because because because. Now who's the next, is that where you come in? Somewhat. So what we do at that point is uh, the patients that, that fit those criteria, uh, they're actually reviewed by a, a panel of physicians. Uh, that panel consists of a radiation oncologist, so someone like us, uh, the thoracic surgeon, uh, the medical oncologist, uh, the radiologist, and the interventional radiologist, uh, as well as the pathologist. Mm -hmm. And so you have all those doctors together in one room looking at those images, trying to figure out what's the best next step. Uh, if it's something that can be easily gotten to with just a, a needle through the skin, the interventional radiologist will be the next person that you'll meet. So that he can, under uh, a special type of CAT scan guidance, where he's actually looking at a CAT scan while he's passing the needle, or looking at an ultrasound while he's passing the needle, will get a biopsy of the, the spot. Uh, so that's where that biopsy really comes into play. There are times when he'll look at it and say, gosh, you know, this is too close to something vital. It's too close to an artery. I don't want to put a needle that close to it. Uh, or that the patient just uh, isn't, um, uh, isn't well enough to undergo a biopsy. Um, that's when we, we usually employ the PET CT scan to try to give us some more information. Uh, but we try to take a team approach to it. We try to get everybody uh, in one room and uh, really just kind of talk so the case through. So all these people, you said, I mean, I can understand the medical oncologist. That's a generalist that has studied cancer. Yeah, that's your chemotherapy doctor. That's your chemo guy yeah. or gal. Mm -hmm. Interventional, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what label do we give that person? So Why that, is he or she allowed at the table? Yeah, <laughs> so that, that person is a radiologist, someone that looks at CAT scans, MRIs, all of those things. That's what they trained in. Uh, but then they received extra training to uh, actively use those images. So uh, looking at them in real time to do procedures. So to do needle guided biopsies. So they're actually a surgeon. Yeah, they're a proceduralist. They, they do the procedures themselves. So why are they called interventional? Because they intervene. Mm -hmm. They do the, pro <laughs> right. don't all of you intervene in some way? Uh, they're to varying degrees, right? Yeah. So a radiologist can be either a diagnostic radiologist or an interventional radiologist. And so a diagnostic oh. radiologist is using radiologic imaging techniques to For help diagnose yeah. a problem. That whereas makes an sense. interventional radiologist is actually trying to intervene. Okay, on we're the past diagnosis. Mm -hmm. We're going after spot. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now that makes more sense because the diagnostic person says spot. Right. right. The next level is get spot out of there. Yeah. Or okay. take a piece. Or, yeah. or take a piece, but one way or another, you're going in. Yeah. Right. Okay. And you got the chemo covered. Who else gets a free lunch at this table? <laughs> <laughs> no lunches anymore. Um, we typically have a pathologist there, and the pathologists are kind of the unsung heroes. Yeah, but that, that word scares people. These pathologists, I'm not dead yet. No. <laughs> so, um, Pathology just is, uh, they're the person that, that takes that piece, uh, goes through it with a fine tooth comb, really cuts it up into tiny That's pieces. That's the one slicing it and analyzing mm -hmm. tissue. Exactly, mm -hmm. looking at it under a microscope and saying, this is what it is. This is a lung cancer, this is not a lung cancer. You know, they, they do special stains to try to figure out, is this a cancer that started in the lung? Could it be a cancer that started somewhere else, like a cancer from it the colon? It metastasize and move? I, exactly, and so uh, they, they really are the unsung heroes because most patients will never interact with their pathologist, but their pathologist plays a tremendous role in their diagnosis as well as their well, treatment. That's what you always think, the pathologist is down, you know, it's. What, on those TV shows. It's a guy down the basement that nobody ever sees, mm -hmm. that you never want to really know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it, realistically, they're the people who are looking at the tissue yeah. 
to try and determine where did spot come from exactly. and how bad is spot. Yeah, that's exactly right. So now, if they determine they need your services, you know, one of the questions, and I'll pose it to you in a way that people would, I'm in Milford. Do I get the same treatment as if I drive all the way to Boston? Um, I, I, that's, that's, that's what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one of the greatest joys of, uh, of what we do out here is we take uh, what we do at our main campus, both of us go into the main campus for some perform research in Boston. Uh, but what we're really trying to do is we're trying to, to bring the best techniques, the techniques that are on the cutting edge, maybe even a little beyond the cutting edge, uh, right here in your community so that you're not having to, to make that drive an hour and a half into downtown Boston I, I, and, and try to park down there. Right. I think that's probably <laughs> the biggest complaint I hear. But we're trying to, to make the exact same treatments, the exact same clinical trials, so the mm -hmm. stuff that uh, is beyond the cutting edge. Uh, we're trying to bring it right here so that you can but get it right next door. Realistically, when you think about, we all want to take care of our family. But not everybody can say, well, I'm going to take the next six weeks every afternoon off mm -hmm. to drive a family member into Boston. Yeah. You know, so that's got to be hard. And number two, the tension. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about, by the time I get there, <laughs> you know, am I really in the right state of mind for treatment? Right. So being offered treatment here, I mean, I've said it on the air before, my sainted mother was, I got a phone call saying, we can do more tests, but we're telling you from our experience, we really think she has intense, intestinal cancer. She's prepped, we'd like her to prep for a test, we'd like to just take her tomorrow and deal with it. The fact it was in Milford, you know, that she just had to drive, or we drove her obviously, mm -hmm. but we just had to drive two or three miles, just seemed to have an incredible positive effect on her outlook and her willingness to really comply to all the treatments. But again, people worry. So you go to Binney Street, you do your research, you bring it out here and do you have the tools and the environment? I know, John, you want to. <laughs> Question is, can you? I, yeah, I, I mean, I think the answer to that is absolutely. Um, we are trying to, to port and replicate exactly what we do in Boston, in Milford. Uh, our clinic is run the same way. We, have, uh, we share a lot of the same resources. We share a lot of the same colleagues, the thoracic surgeons, and uh, folks that come out here are also Brigham and Women's uh, thoracic surgeons. So I, I think the word that worried me is when you say we try. No, so, so, <laughs> so let me rephrase, we do. Yeah. yeah, see that makes me feel better. You know, if I'm gonna trust you with the most important thing in my life, you know, my darling bride, my daughters, or my sainted mother. I don't want to hear try, <laughs> you know. But, you know, you talk about some of the techniques that are now really hitting, you know, the forefront of cancer treatment. You know, not taking umpteen weeks, yeah. but bringing a higher dose, more focus. When you came on before, you talked about shaping it, and. Mm -hmm which always amazes me is how you shape electrons. <laughs> they seem to want to do their own thing. But talk to me about, you know, the Sabre, the new technique that they're using in Boston. Can I get it in Milford? Yeah, so I think that's one of our, um, uh, one of the most exciting things is that we are able to bring uh, what you sometimes hear called Sabre or SBRT or what we call stereotactic body radiation. And what that is is, trying exactly like you said it's trying to compress that six weeks that you may have heard about uh, six weeks of radiation Monday through Friday daily uh, instead 30 try visits to Boston 30 visits to Boston instead trying to give that over three visits all the dose to a very focused area uh, and it's the kind of pinnacle of modern technology that to be able to do it. We had to have about five or six new technologies all evolve at once to be able to, to do it. And uh, we've been doing it out at Milford here for, uh, for several years. Uh, we do it the exact same way we do it in Boston. And we have a, a lot of great success with it. So there's no reason, you know, when I look at the journals or, you know, people Google, 
and they say, you know, the SBRT is the latest and greatest. Well, I have to go to the Farber on Binney Street for this, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you're saying, no, I can have the exact same treatment with the same protocols out here. Yeah. That's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's really important because too many of us grew up. I mean, Frank Saber, now Ed Kelly yells at me when I used to call it the little red hospital that could. You know, when I was born, it was a little red hospital building, mm -hmm. and that was the Milford Hospital. You know, or they had the Whitensville Hospital. When it came together, everybody was amazed it became a bigger little red building. <laughs> now it's amazing when I look at you know, when you talk about stereotactic, you know, I, I think of some of the robotic surgeries using Da Vinci. Yeah. I mean, that's a million, two million dollar toy. I mean, I just thought of Giovanni and a couple people that had a heart attack when I call it their pride and joy a toy. <laughs> but a million bucks to be able to bring the latest and greatest technologies to Milford. Isn't that what you're offering with the Saber or SBRT, whatever you're calling it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it really is kind of, uh, I think we have the, we have the best toys, yeah. I, I, I think. <laughs> ours are, ours are, our, ours are uh, a, little, a little more expensive than that, but, uh, but they really are, you know, sort of the latest and greatest and, and always evolving. So we're uh, always trying to stay, stay right there on that cutting edge. And, you know, that's, my, my hat's off to Ed and Phil and all the senior managers, because even in today, when you hear about Medicare cutting what they're reimbursing, mm -hmm. and so many local hospitals just having to give up the fight because they can't afford to, somehow, you know, you'll hear, well, this year the hospital lost a few million dollars. Oh my God. And yet, they seem to be totally calm and say, yep, we'll adjust. But I don't see them scrimping on the tools. You know, I, I keep, every time I look up something, the latest and greatest technology is here in Milford. You know, what other techniques are you using now in Milford? So that's the latest and greatest. Are there other types of cancers that you have to use more traditional treatments? Well, yeah, so even within lung cancer, um, there are uh, a lot of cases where we have to use the more protracted course of radiation that can be anywhere from six to seven weeks. Um, it still utilizes actually the same machine that we use for SBRT, um, but we're just using a, uh, we're just giving a slightly lower dose and, and um, giving it over a, a longer period of time. And those, why? Unless you say, I don't like John Smith, so I'm going <laughs> to torture him so, or her. Right. Well, why would you choose one versus the other. So this, is, this goes back to the initial part of the conversation about screening and detecting cancer early. We're talking about SBRT for early stage lung cancers where there's just one tumor in the middle of the lung. We found a spot. We found a spot and it's cancer, but it hasn't spread anywhere else within the chest. Uh, there are cases where cancer is detected when it's already more advanced and it's involving the lymph nodes, which can be kind of in the center of your chest. And in those situations, we can no longer use that very focused high dose radiation because we're treating a larger area that's next to some other vital organs. So now all of a sudden I got cancer cells throughout the whole drainage system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why would I use nukes on something like that? Why wouldn't I use chemo? So um, it's not an either or proposition. Uh, there are many situations where you would actually use a combination of chemotherapy and radiation, uh, with the chemotherapy sensitizing the cancer cells to the effects of radiation, and so it can have a, a better effect than just using one or the other on its own. And so the situation that I just described, where cancer has spread to the lymph nodes and it can't be addressed surgically, will often be treated with a combination of chemotherapy and radiation. Now I'm reading about some of the new imaging agents that, you know, in the old days it seemed like, okay, it's spread to the lymph nodes. Out come all the lymph nodes, which doesn't have a great effect long term, mm -hmm. but I guess does short term. If I can keep you alive, you can deal with the side effects. When I think of chemo, 
I think of a systemic uh, approach. It's getting everywhere. So, you know, to me, chemo, God, and some of the uh, oncologists hate me when I say it's, do I, how do I balance killing the patient a little slower than killing the cancer? But it seems like, you know, when I look at the toxicity of some of these chemo agents, it scares the heck out of me. But if I got spots, Spot mm -hmm. and his cousins are all through my lungs. What do you do with radiation? Do you just zorch the whole area? Or? <laughs> I wouldn't quite say zorch, but we, uh, <laughs> we, we do, uh, depending on how extensive it is, we would actually try to radiate all of the areas where we believe the disease might be, um, might be hiding. And so that does mean that if there's a, a primary tumor, say up here, and then you have lymph nodes here, then we would treat that entire area with radiation. Now, hitting it with radiation, mm -hmm. you know, I joke about the chemo, but it's no joke. It has very bad side effects. I mean, hitting my whole area with radiation, how do you get it to hit the cancer and leave my lungs alone? Yeah, so it's, uh, that's what we do. Right. Um, so that, that's really kind of uh, what, uh, what all of our training is in. So. Uh, we employ a lot of techniques, so all the cancer uh, cancers that we treat, we do at least what's called conformal radiation. So we take that CAT scan uh, that we uh, do in our office, uh, and we essentially make an exact 3D computer model of your anatomy. So the radiation is completely custom made for you. Uh, and then what we do from that 3D model is we say, what do we want to hit? What do we want to miss? So we're designing targets and we're design, designing things we want to miss, like your heart, your healthy lung, your swallowing tube, your esophagus, your spinal cord. And what do we want to hit? So where's the tumor? What's our target? Uh, and then we use supercomputers essentially to figure out the ideal way to bend and shape the radiation so that it gets where it wants to So go. it's not like a carpet bombing. This is not apocalypse now where I'm just no, hitting no. the whole area no. and I walk away with scorched earth. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, I think that's what most people uh, picture when they think of yeah. radiation. And, and that probably was true, you know, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. You start to see that change in the 70s and 80s. And then really when uh, computer technology advanced by leaps and bounds, when CAT scan technology advanced by leaps and bounds, uh, what we do advanced by leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. And so now we're really talking about uh, aiming the radiation in a very, very uh, targeted way. So it's not way. a wide spray here. I mean, even when you say you're treating my lymph nodes, the spots, mm -hmm. you're still going in and, you know, hitting. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a wider spray than when we're doing the SBRT. Right. Um, the SBRT is kind of like a jet stream being pointed at it, whereas, you know, we are still kind of spraying a little bit wider when we're doing this form of radiation. But as John said, we are still able to shape it in such a way that we can try to avoid getting as much healthy Well, you're minimizing the collateral damage to cells, mm -hmm. which now makes more sense because I just visioned, you know, this carpet bombing of my body and it's like, okay, if door number one is that trip on the final bus, right. <laughs> And let's hope we don't get suntan lotion. <laughs> you know, don't want to be going to a warm place. But realistically, it's evolved to a point where there's no general radiation anymore. It's all targeted and shaped. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you shape a charge? I mean, I think of a, you know, a point source, and you're shooting electrons out. How do you get them to bend? Or when you talk about bending them. Yeah, so I mean, I've seen Pele bend a soccer ball. I can <laughs> see that. Right. Yeah, so, so there's really two things that we do. Um, one is how fast the, the x-rays come out of the machine, uh, how fast they come out, uh, and we call that the energy. Uh, dictates how deep it goes into the body before it deposits its energy. So that's one key part. So we speed it up really fast. That's how we get it in deep instead of just hitting the skin. Uh, and then the other part is uh, there's a device on the head of the treatment machine. Uh, and that device is a lot of little bitty sliding uh, pieces of something similar to lead. Uh, and from every angle that the machine goes, and a lot of times now we're treating you from a 360 degree arc, um, every angle, uh, that those little sliding windows are shaping 
the beam. So you're actually blocking part, when you say shaping, yeah. mm -hmm. you're blocking part of the beam. So what, you know, clover leaf, diamond, whatever you want to call the shape. Mm -hmm. Now that makes sense, because I'm trying to figure out how you get it to shape, but you're blocking part of the whole right. beam. Yeah. And by creating different shapes in a 360 degree arc around, you can really um, very uh, finely shape the target. So, so if you were looking, if you were standing where that point is and looking down, if you could imagine it, it what's coming out of there is shaped exactly like the target is from that angle. Mm -hmm. But then as it moves, it reconfigures to be shaped like the target is from the next angle. So it's really adjusting on so the, the fly. So the idea of the shape is you've got a fine enough resolution exactly. that as you go 360, you're able to target whatever it looks like mm -hmm. from that angle. From that, from the angle around. Yeah. So diamond here, clover leaf there, circle here, whatever the design. Exactly. It's buried in me. This nasty little spot. When you put a beam through me, why aren't you zorching the skin? You know, when I think of a fire hose, it cuts right through, and okay, it'll get the spot, but everything in its way is now blasted also. Well, that's why we do treat it from multiple angles. So if you think about it, if, if we really were just treating it with straight on the whole entire time, then you're right, the skin would get burned. Um, but by coming at it from multiple angles, the, um, you know, the, the, the central focus that we're trying to treat, which is the tumor, is getting 100% of the dose, but the various spots around Well, why doesn't the, I mean, I can understand you said you vary the velocity of the charge? The, the energy, but it's kind of yeah. like the speed. The speed. So if it's faster, it goes deeper and doesn't bother the outside? Because the skin is one thing. The muscle, the outer lung tissue, or you know, if you're talking about a solid organ, I know people call lung solid organ, but it never felt like a solid organ to me. Mostly air. Mm -hmm. Mostly air. But you know, you talk about a kidney or a liver, and if the tumor's in the middle, how do I get to the middle without killing the cells on the way in? Yeah. I, I always like to think of it uh, as like if the three of us were all holding our own flashlights and each one of our flashlights, the battery is about to die on it. So if I shine my flashlight onto a spot in the floor, it's pretty dim. But if all three of us shine our s flashlight onto the floor, it's really bright in that one spot. So in the I middle. am affecting the outer tissue, mm -hmm. but by minimizing the dose, a hundred times. Mm -hmm. The effect on your toe of a hundred flashlights, dim or not, is very bright. Exactly. So it's, instead of three flashlights, the machine is really shaping it infinitely. Mm -hmm. It's going in a continuous arc. See, now that makes more sense because I'm saying, how does it jump through the tissue? It doesn't. It's just such a low dose in any exactly. like one degree mm -hmm. that it's not hurting as much the outside of the tissue. And that's not to say that there aren't some side effects uh, associated with the radiation that are a result of what you're describing, because there is some radiation dose passing through areas that we try to avoid. But as, as John was saying earlier, what, as part of our training, we're, we're trying to um, create a radiation plan that, that gives as much dose as possible to the cancer, but as little as possible to the surrounding organs. And hence why it's so important that you have a tie back to Mother Brigham <laughs> or Mother Farber, because there is the central point, the nexus of all information that you can draw on, even if you're in Milford. And, and nothing is static. Uh, you know, everything changes, uh, not, maybe not day to day, but month to month, the way we do things uh, evolves. And so uh, that's one of the greatest parts, I think, of our jobs is that uh, we're, always, uh, we're always evolving. We're always trying to get better. We're always trying to give patients more effective treatments and uh, treatments that are easier to tolerate. Yeah, but again, being very self-centered, um, I'm glad you're learning but when I need you, <laughs> I don't want to know that it's on the job training. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the biggest thing. You know, God bless Frank and Ed and Phil for bringing this level of care to Milford. You know, because again, 
you know, touch wood, and, uh, 12 years, 13 years ago, my mom had cancer. And she's here now to complain about it. <laughs> you know, and to go visit, as she says, Dr. Mona. You know, every six months for the last decade plus. But you sit there and say, what a wonderful testament to not only the technology we have, because she's still here, but to the environment that it's still the same physicians taking care of us. I mean, we joke when we first started in Milford, you could trace your lineage to four physicians. You know, Cicchetti, Mastriani, you know, you go through it. It was only four of them that brought, and they tell you, I brought you in, I'll take you out. <laughs> you know, they knew you, there was only four physicians. Now, it's amazing you know, what you all are bringing and how well you're taking care of our families. So from one old man who loves being at the center of the universe and hopes he never has to visit you professionally, <laughs> thank you for taking care of our families and well, for caring enough to stay around. And as always, to our six loyal viewers, I want to say good night, may God bless, may tomorrow be a better day than today. But every time we do one of these medical shows, we learn over and over that the level of care, the depth, as well as the breadth here in Milford is amazing. We no longer have to go out of the center of the universe here and go all the way to Boston 30 times because even new treatments like the SRBT and all are available here. And if there's any questions, they are part of the research group at Mother Farber, at Mother Brigham, you know, and you do get all the same level of treatment. So to all our medical professionals, thank you. May God bless. Good night. Thanks for joining.